Emeritus Dorothy Sutton, who will now introduce Richard Dawkins. and that um, the last three years of that was a chair of public understanding of science. And public understanding means that he does not talk down to us, but instead he wants to raise us up to his level. He tries to do that, and we try to comply with that as much as possible. Uh, you know that he's written a string of best-selling books, that, uh, and I've been teaching English on the, uh, for 30 years now on the university level, and for the compelling elegance of his language and his subject matter, I give Richard Dawkins an A+. Plus. <laughs> you know that his uh, seminal work, the, the Selfish Gene, uh, changed the way scientists view natural selection, and that it has sold more than a million copies, and it's been translated into more than 25 languages. Uh, Richard Dawkins has been uh, inducted into the Royal Society of Science, which includes such lesser luminaries as Sir Isaac Newton and Charles Darwin. <laughs> but did you know he was also inducted into the Royal Society of Literature? What a wonderful uh, blending of arts and sciences that is. Well, what's he like on a personal level? Twelve years ago, he asked if he could read one of my Darwin poems to the audience when he was being inducted into the Royal Society of Science. There's your arts and sciences together again. I thought that was an extremely nice thing for him to do, and we've been steadfast friends ever since. Uh, as busy as he is to take out time to, to be a friend to somebody over here in Kentucky. Well, I'm here to testify that he's one of the most caring, kind, and compassionate human beings that you could ever hope to meet. And uh, he's most generous to, of, his, of himself and of his resources. The uh, foundation, that he, that he has founded gives thousands and thousands of dollars for disaster relief around the world. But the most important thing you need to know about Richard Dawkins is that he is not a delusion. He's here in flesh and blood. A big Eastern Kentucky welcome for Richard Dawkins. Supernatural magic, 
Cinderella's fairy godmother turning a pumpkin into a coach, or frogs turning into a prince. Illusion, conjuring, stage magic, which of course is just tricks, and finally, poetic magic, the one that I mean in my title. We're moved to tears by a beautiful piece of music, and we describe the performance as magical. We gaze up at the stars on a dark night with no light pollution. Breathless with joy, we say the sight of the Milky Way is pure magic. We use the same word to describe sunset over Grand Canyon, or an alpine landscape, or a rainbow against a dark sky. In this sense, magical just means moving, exhilarating, something that gives us goosebumps, something that makes us feel more fully alive. What this book tries to show is that reality the facts of the real world, as understood through the methods of science, reality is magical in this third sense, the poetic sense, the good-to-be-alive sense. <laughs> Supernatural magic. It isn't just that frogs, as a matter of fact, don't turn into princes. There's a deeper reason why supernatural magic cannot happen. Frogs and princes and coaches are complicated things with many parts that need to be put together in a special way, a special pattern that doesn't just happen by accident. If they're not put together in that special pattern, they just don't work. Complicated means statistically improbable. And I'm talking about statistically improbable in a specific direction which you can specify in advance as being good for something. In the case of a prince, I'm not really sure what that's good for, but... <laughs> Let's make it a bit easier for Cinderella's fairy godmother by supposing that instead of calling for a pumpkin, she had called for all the parts you need for assembling a coach. An Ikea kit for making <laughs> a coach. All the planks of wood, panes of glass, pots of glue, screws, nuts, and so on. Shake them all up in a bag and then go on shaking and go on shaking and see whether in a million years what you'll get is a working coach. And of course, you won't. The odds against are too great, the number of parts are too great, the different ways of combining them are too great, and only one of them will work. Sometimes we can literally count the number of ways you can reshuffle a series of bits, and the sort of classical mathematical way of doing it is with a pack of cards. Suppose we're playing bridge, and each player, each of four players, has dealt with 13 cards at random. I pick up my cards, and I gasp with astonishment, because I find that I have a perfect hand in spades. I lay my cards on the table and say, well, I've won this round. And then, one by one, the other three players lay down their hands, and each one of them has a perfect hand. Would this be supernatural magic? We might be tempted to think so. It could just happen, however. Mathematicians can calculate the chance of such a remarkable deal happening by luck. And it turns out to be, as I'm sure you've all worked out in your head by now, 536 octillion, 447 septillion, 737 sextillion, 765 quintillion, 408, don't even try this. <laughs> 192 trillion, 839 million, 237 million, 444,000. If you sat down and played cards, if you played cards for a trillion years, and you might on one occasion get a perfect deal like that. But actually, of course, that deal is no more unlikely than every other deal of cards that's ever been dealt. It's just that this particular one is special. We notice it. We don't notice all the others because they're just ordinary. Living things are very much not ordinary. They're not ordinary in the sense that they work. They fly, they swim, they dig, they pursue, they escape, they, they climb trees, they do things which are very, very improbable. And that could not come about by chance. That cannot come about by sheer random luck. It was the genius of Charles Darwin to realize 
how you could get organized complexity, statistical improbability, on a staggering scale in the direction of usefulness, usefulness in all sorts of different ways depending upon the species, but in general usefulness in surviving and reproducing. And Darwin's secret, of course, was not randomness, but the non-random process of natural selection. <coughs> Spread out over many generations, there is a random element called mutation. Mutation is random, but each mutational step is not all that improbable, not too improbable to have come about by chance. When you have a large number of generations of mutation, each one random but then non-randomly selected in a cumulative fashion, then you get the prodigies of adaptive complexity which we recognize as living things. <coughs>